Well, I mean, if you t tune, tune in to early 20th century American literary modernism, your Hemingways and your Faulkners and, and, and whatnot, the, the general stance was a deep, deep loathing for the university. The, for a literary modernist, for an, anyone with an avant-garde sensibility, the university represented the old uh, and the staid. Uh, and uh, universities typically were not hospi hospitable at all to the idea that, that literature is still being born. Um, it was about consecrating a, a, and studying the works of the past. The origin of the title of the program era uh, lies in a classic account of literary modernism called the Pound Era. There was this drive to, to, to nominate one individual as the key personage who would be at the center of an entire literary uh, era. The rise of the program, of the institution, is in fact the most distinctive literary historical phenomenon of the period. Probably the majority of the books that we see or that count as sort of high literature that we would encounter in a university setting, um, in an MFA setting, would have come, the, the people would be in and out of the program. They, the writers would have come out of the program as students, and if they were successful, they would go back in as teachers maybe, or the teachers would have been writers who were successful who are now in the program. You can make a pretty easy case to the dean um, that uh, this is gonna run in the black because apparently there's just an endless well of desire to be a writer out there in the world. Uh, and uh, seen from a certain perspective, you can, it, it can seem like exploiting that desire uh, uh, to, to, to be a writer. And in some cases, it no doubt is. Uh, that, of course, is not the whole story, though. And I think that, 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 that's an ancillary effect in some cases of perfectly earnest motives to, to sure. teach and to learn and to be creative. Um, and so just imagine a university today being told that you could have one of the great novelists of the century teaching in your department. And uh, the department head, a very famous linguist uh, by the name of Roman Jakobson, says, an, a writer teaching in an English department? What are we going to have next? An elephant teaching in the zoology department? So. <laughs> Uh, in 1936, there was one creative writing program in the United States. It was the one you may have heard of um, at Iowa. Um, and now there are, depending on how one counts, uh, approaching 300 MFA programs and then various programs of other kinds as well. Uh, hundreds of programs, all of them staffed by novelists and poets and writers of various kinds. Um, cumulatively, these programs have reshaped the uh, political, in some degree, aesthetic economies of American literary production. Uh, you may have gotten the impression, or you may even have inf formed this impression yourself, that this rise of the creative writing program ranks uh, quite high on the list of 20th century disasters no. um, and travesties. Uh, it certainly ranks below Nazism. <laughs> uh, global warming is definitely bigger, <laughs> a bigger problem than creative writing. Um, so the opening gambit of my book is to try to resist that debate. MFA is good, bad. What do we hope um, and what can we hope that institutions uh, can do for us as writers and, and artists and, and intrinsically creative beings? Uh, and two, um, how further uh, might we not be ashamed of but rather uh, redeem? the institutionality of writing and art making in our time. Uh, a utopia where uh, the collectivity we experience in our institutional and institutionalized lives is redeemed as a kind of precondition for collective action. If you think about teaching in a creative writing program as a form of patronage, it's not. It's a form of employment. But if you, you know, if you, if you sort of see it on that model, it really has fundamentally changed the way, you know, 300 programs times faculty of, you know, four, five, six, you know, however many are in any given program, you're talking about thousands of writers now who make their middle class living from teaching creative writing classes. Ultimately, it leads us to an area that um, Mark calls systematic creativity or um, we might call it institutional creativity, um, which I think really goes against the notion that a lot of us have 
about what it means to be creative. That's a utopian notion, but also just an, a, an understanding of our own experience um, as being creative humans. What happens in a world of institutional creativity? What, what are the solidarities we get from it? What are the right. utopian moments we get from yeah. it? Yeah. Um, what are the penalties of it? What are the debts of it? You can think of how many people ar arrive at a creative writing program or an MFA program in general and finally found a find a community of people who don't question the value of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's huge and easy to underestimate mm -hmm. when you think about people growing up in various circumstances in a world mm -hmm. that is frequently entirely hostile to such non-utilitarian uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of pursuits. Like, how can we possibly affiliate without going through this kind of program? You know, there's the sort of risk, the pooling of capital, like the fact that Columbia University is able to get a million dollars for every 10 art students. You know, in two years, 10 art students may generate, at least through loans, a million dollars for Columbia so that they can buy more buildings um, which you don't actually own, even though you help them purchase. So the question is not like the scandal of the individual necessarily for me, but how can individuals create institutions that they want to be part of, where they see the power of the institution yeah. as collectively generated, yes. rather than just like a random chance occurrence that they yeah. need to mm -hmm. participate no. It turns out that it's in the moments of greatest conformity uh, where new paradigms of thinking seem to become possible. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a sort of scalar version of what Cyrus just pointed out, or the question of uh, the movement between like the orthodox and the, and the vernacular, right? Like, what is the social field we want to be in to recognize things as novel, as new, whether those things are social or aesthetic or economic? Mm -hmm. and, and is this institution the place for that to happen? If that is a place that does produce a certain amount of conformity. When we're thinking about our institutions, we might be asking ourselves, what is our kind of timeline of action? And, mm -hmm. and do we want to build something for the long term? Or do we actually want to build a super radical, in and out organization, and a uh, sort of temporary institution, and then let a, the sort of like more longer term institutions build around those kinds of um, more short term tactics. It's being part of a, knowing that you're part of a, lar of a larger system of ideas and that, and that you are an entry point through your work, through your creative projects, you are an entry point to this large mass of ideas and that you ought to have a sense of, of how you operate within that larger structure and really to find ways to be a good host to that larger mass. I think that, that is the, the challenge of our time as artists, is to, is to find a way to disappear as individuals at tactical times and appear as